Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are watching and thank you for attending this lecture series. Welcome to my lecture on circuits for machine learning and AI. I'm Marianne Verhelst, I'm a professor at KU Leuven and I'm also a research director at IMEC. And in these roles, my research interests lie in digital design and processor design, especially for AI and machine learning. What I want to do with you today is first of all walk through these buzzwords. What's AI? What's ML? What does deep learning mean? To then see how in these fields there are important challenges. Challenges that we can tackle with circuit design. So I want to show you the solutions and the opportunities that lie there now and in the future. So let's start with AI. AI stands for artificial intelligence meaning any program that mimics human intelligence. More practically, it's typically a program that can sense something, it can reason about it, and it can act or adapt upon this. But this is still a very broad container term. For example, a simple PID controller that controls the flow in a pipe is already such an artificially intelligent system. When we think about AI, we often kind of mean a subset of this big container term. We think of it often in the terms of machine learning. And machine learning is a subclass of the broad class of artificial intelligence, which stands for algorithms that can autonomously learn themselves from data. So you give it a bunch of data and some labels you assign to each data item, and it will learn to distinguish these items itself. So I, for example, give it thousands of pictures of cats, thousands of pictures of dogs, and the system itself learns how to distinguish a cat from a dog. Now, how it learns this can still be done in tremendous amount of ways. There exist different types of machine learning models which you can exploit for this. Recently, one type of model became very popular and led to extremely good results or accuracies. And that type is deep learning. Deep learning, again, a subset of the bigger class of machine learning, is a type of machine learning algorithms that exploits very deep neural networks. Networks consisting out of many layers of neurons, where each neuron processes information from the previous layer. And it learns how it has to process this to distinguish the input features in the way you want them to do that. These machine learning algorithms became very popular, I told you, and they're really literally into everyday thing, object you find around you these days. Obviously, every time you do a Google search or you get a personalized Facebook or Amazon recommendation, you are using ML in the background. But also every bank transaction you do, every email that you receive has gone through a machine learning model to detect fraud or spam. Every time you unlock your phone with your face, every time you talk to your phone with a speech command, you use a machine learning model. Even if I take a picture with my phone, machine learning is used to distinguish background for for, from foreground, to distinguish different types of um, features or settings and filters and so on. And obviously more and more objects become smart, like the smart car, smart glass, all using machine learning algorithms. So it's really everywhere around us, but as an electronic engineer, what I ask myself is basically, where are these machine learning models, algorithms then executed? And here you start to see some diversity. A subgroup of all these algorithms is typically running in the cloud, on big, massive compute farms, servers, as somewhere centrally sitting together. Um, for example, every Google search I do goes through a cloud search. Every email filter check is done on a, um, a spam filter somewhere in the cloud and so on. Some algorithms, however, cannot afford to be sent to the cloud. It can be for privacy reasons. I don't want my data to leave my phone. It can be for latency reasons. I don't have the time to send something all the way there and back or even for energy reasons. It costs a lot of power to send video streams, for example, from my phone to the cloud and back. 
So those algorithms, I don't want them to run in the cloud. These applications will typically run on my phone or on another edge device. So we call this edge computing or even extreme edge. If I talk about wearables, uh, very small devices, for example. So compute algorithms for machine learning executed in the cloud, executed at the edge, but they typically suffer from the same problems. First of all, they are both striving for higher and higher throughput, more searches per second, more classifications per second, uh, shorter latencies, and so on, both in edge and in cloud. And also, they both strive for better and better energy efficiency so that my phone can survive longer on my battery, but also in the cloud, I have an energy problem because of the cooling of these servers. The less energy they consume, the more servers I can put at a lower cooling budget. So this opens opportunities for hardware or circuit designers. However, before we can try to understand them and look into them, we have to see what these algorithms effectively need. And how does such a machine learning model run? How can it be implemented? Well, I told you before that these deep neural networks, they basically consist out of many layers of neurons. And every neuron, every dot here, basically is a weighted sum. So it takes the inputs of the previous layer, it multiplies them with weights, which are the red connections here, my Ws, and it takes a, um, a sum over all of these results to compute an output. So every neuron does many multiply accumulate operations. And in my system, I have many, many neurons together, and we typically group them layer by layer, and then mathematically, I can make my representation a bit easier because every layer basically converts input neurons into output neurons through a matrix or a tensor operation. Right? These input neurons can be represented as a two-dimensional input matrix multiplied with a two-dimensional weight matrix representing the connections, resulting in a two-dimensional output matrix representing the outputs of this layer and hence the inputs of the next layer. This is a bit of simplified representation, but it will be sufficient for the explanation that we need for the rest of the talk. Now the question is, of course, okay, multiply accumulates, but how many then? Well, every neuron itself can easily require thousands of multiply accumulation operations, and the whole network together then easily end up to trillions or tens of trillions of operations. And for example, for a smart glass application, I will need about a bit more than 10 trillion operations per second. 10 trillion multiply accumulate operations to represent all these matrix matrix multiplications. 10 trillion sounds a lot, but is it feasible with today's hardware? Well, let's see. What you see here is a graph and I walk you through step by step. On the vertical axis, you see the computation speed in terms of um, billions of operations per second. And here, uh, my smart glass applications require a bit more than 10 trillion operations per second. And on the horizontal axis, you see power consumption. For example, in a smart glass, I don't want to spend more than 100 milliwatts or my battery will be drained immediately. Looking at speed or throughput and power, you can derive something of energy or something in terms of energy efficiency. And these are the diagonal lines. They couple how fast I can compute per watt of power that I invest. And here, one tera operations per second per watt, 10 tera operations per second per watt. And you see my smart glass application requires a bit more than 100 tera operations per second per watt, almost a thousand tops per watt. It's a bit of weird, um, metric so let's translate it into something more tangible um, if you flip the numbers upside down and you take the inverse you basically express it into how many joules of energy can i invest to do one operation and this line then corresponds to doing one femtojoule per operation that's really the target i have to get to to enable these smart glass applications spending one femtojoule to do a multiplication or accumulation is that a lot? Well, one femtojoule is the amount of charge or the amount of energy that you require 
to charge a small capacitor of one femtofarad up to one volt and discharge it again. It's a very small amount of energy. But let's try to do compute with such a small amount of energy. That will be the goal of this task, this talk. First of all, we have to see, can we already do it today? Well, let's see. If I take a GPU, which is where typically neural networks are executed on, I will get this throughput and this power consumption for different commercial products. And you see they can get throughput, but they cannot get sufficient energy efficiency. I can try to go for FPGAs, F field programmable logic arrays. Do they give me better results? Not really. But if you look at the chips out there in the field today, you see an enormous amount of custom processors optimized for these machine learning workloads. They're called TPUs, tensor processing units, or NPUs, neural processing units, or dozens of other names, but they're really processors pushed to get very good efficiency on machine learning workloads. And as you can see here on all these different dots, they indeed do significantly better. These kind of chips are designed typically either by academia in research first, but also more recently by companies. And first of all, by companies with a long history in processor design, in chip design, uh, typically for edge applications and so on, like a Qualcomm, Huawei, Apple, and so on. But, and that's extremely interesting, more recently these chips are also designed by companies which never ever made a chip or a commercial chip in the history of their company, which now, due to this machine learning, due to this deep learning, start to develop their own processors, their own custom processing chips, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Tesla are in this boat right now. So what makes it that now all these companies get so excited about chip design for machine learning? Well, it's really because they see this need to push energy efficiency and push throughput of these applications. And if they have a chip that can do that better than the others, they have a big competitive advantage in this field. So it's all about decreasing joules per operation, increasing the amount of operations I can do per millimeter square of circuit per chip. So let's see how they do this and especially what opportunities come from the circuit design in these systems. Well, for that we'll start by the typical structure of such a processor, a neural processor unit, an NPU. And remember that we had to do this matrix matrix multiplication. So this will typically be done on a processor with a very large data path where there are many parallel PEs or processing elements. And a processing element in this case is typically a multiply accumulate unit because we have to do trillions of them. Of course, data has to be brought into these processing elements and that typically happens to an on-chip memory hierarchy. So on-chip SRAM or register files and typically a combination of multi-level SRAM and register files. This date memory is typically too small to hold the big neural networks that we want nowadays. So this data is provided from off-chip and then brought on chip to do the compute. And I bring on chip some inputs, some weights. I bring them into my processing units to do a multiply accumulate and get some output results, which are then pushed back to the on chip memory or eventually to the off chip memory to start the whole cycle all over again uh, for the next layer. Now, I told you earlier, these processors, we really want to push them for energy efficiency joules per operation has to go down, we want to push them for throughput, as many operations per second per millimeter square of chip. As a circuit designer, I see this as a challenge in terms of memory efficiency and compute efficiency to bring energy down, memory density, compute density to push throughput up. Now let's try to see what we can do from the circuit side, and I'm going to zoom in in the rest of my on energy efficiency, so bringing down the joules per operation. So where does this energy go? First of all, I have to bring the data from the off-chip storage into the chip. That will cost me energy. 
Then I have to bring my input data and my weights from the on-chip memory into my processing elements. This involves a read from the register file or the SRAM. Cost me energy. Then I have to compute my multiply accumulate. Will cost me energy. And then I have to bring my data back into my on-chip SRAM and finally into my off-chip storage. Will cost me energy. So all these components together will contribute to the energy efficiency of my system, to how much joules I effectively spend to perform a useful operation in my system. So what can we do about this as a circuit designer? How can we get these joules per operation done? Well, let's first set the baseline. Assume I do in my data path multiply accumulates with an 8-bit integer at fixed point precision. We can, for example, in 22 nanometer CMOS here, we can derive how much energy it costs me, how much joules or femtojoules it costs me to do a multiply and addition, a register write, a memory or SRAM write or read. And what you can see is the compute is okay, but I have to do, to do one multiply accumulate, I have to fetch two inputs, an accumulation input, write back a result. So I have to do four memory actions to do one compute step. Altogether, it costs me about 500 femtojoule and the majority of that energy is unfortunately in my memory accesses. So as a circuit designer, I want to optimize this. How can I do that? I'll have to tackle my memory access. Of course, I could aim to design a lower energy memory, but I can do something else first. I can change the architecture of my system to more smartly exploit the, the intricacies and the characteristics of the algorithm I'm trying to execute. Because remember from our matrix matrix multiplication that every row in the matrix, every blue row here, will be multiplied with multiple columns of my weights. But every column of my weight will also be multiplied with multiple rows of my input. So every data item, I will need it more than once. I can exploit this because I can fetch these input elements here and I can connect them in parallel to more than one multiplier. So I amortize the cost of fetching this input over multiple operations and hence reduce the energy to spend for one specific operation on memory reads. And for weights I can do the same. I fetch the weight once and I use it in more than one multiplier. Also for the output, I can do this trick because this output is the result of multiplying many of these things and then accumulating them. So instead of going back to the memory for every single multiplication result, I can do many of these operations in parallel, accumulate all the results and only then send the result back into memory. And this again will amortize my write energy over more than one operation, M operations in this case hence effectively reducing the energy I spent for one useful operation in my system. And interestingly, this will of course bring down my total energy of my system, but it will also shift the balance. I now cut down significantly on my memory access energy, but with of course now the middle part, my compute energy becoming dominant. As a circuit designer, interesting. I have a new optimization target. I want to tackle the energy of this compute. So how to do that? Well, if I want to consume less energy on my multiply addition operation, I will start to wonder whether I really need to do 8-bit computation. It turns out that some neural networks in some application are pretty robust to compute at even lower precision. Go with fixed point 4-bit representations, or even fixed point two-bit representations for weights and inputs. At the extreme, some applications even tolerate one-bit neural networks, which means that my input is one bit, zero or one, my weight is one bit, zero or one, computing one-bit outputs. We can do this by letting the input represent a minus one or a plus one, so a zero will basically represent a minus one, the same for the weights, and then I can do the multiplication between these two, a negative number times a negative becomes a positive is a one bit. A negative number times a positive number becomes a negative output represented by a bit zero, and so on. 
Interestingly, this multiplication now is just an XNOR operation. I can implement it with a single gate, an XNOR gate. So every multiplier you see here, I can just replace it by one gate. Now this gives me extreme compute density, super dense operations, also consuming much less energy because I save in my multiplier addition, only one gate, and I even save on my memory read and write because they only have to read and write one bit. So this brings a great energy savings, not necessarily um, changing the balance between memory and compute because I'm shrinking both memory energy and compute energy, but bringing very good energy savings. Question is, can I do even better? It turns out we can. And what we have to realize for this is that in this compute energy that I still have left here, that I want to shrink more, the multipliers are not consuming much anymore. They're XNORs, one gate. But this accumulator, that is the one that is becoming extremely dominant and expensive. So I can try to push it down further, maybe by not computing this in the digital domain anymore, but by doing an addition in the analog domain. How do I do that? Well, I keep my multipliers, my XNOR operations, but these multipliers will now drive or be connected to small capacitors, very small capacitor that at the other side, at the other terminal, all are connected to a common node. If I now have zero and one bits at the output of my multiplication, they will arrive at one plate of my capacitors. With the other node, all the capacitors are combined together. As such, realizing a capacitive divider where some of the capacitors are hooked up to one, to the supply, other capacitors to ground, to zero, and the result will be a capacitive division where the output voltage will be proportional to the amount of ones I have, or the amount of capacitors hooked up to the supply. And this effectively performs an addition in the analog domain. This addition is very compact, of course, but it's especially much more energy efficient than my digital adder I had there, about a factor of 10 more efficient, which kills down again and brings down this red compute energy bar up to there. And now, interestingly, again, my memory energy becomes dominant. As a circuit designer, I have my new optimization target. And that brings me to the last step of my story. I want to further optimize this system, bring down our memory access energy again. And the thing that people are trying there now is avoid having to fetch the data out of the memory, bring it to the compute element to there to the compute. If I could overcome this memory fetch overall, yeah, that would be the best. So instead of trying to bring the data to the compute, we're going to try to bring the compute to the data. Practically speaking, to merge the memory and the compute block to my computations inside my memory. So my data never has to leave my memory anymore. And that, of course, saves a lot of my energy again. How can you do that? Well, it turns out that I can do computations inside an SRAM memory. I can do at least these special computations at these matrix matrix multiplication operations. And bear with me how you can do that. So I want to multiply an input matrix with another input matrix to get an output. What I will first of all do is I will again exploit the same analog addition trick that I did in my previous slide. So I again will add up all the results that, part that, that are part of one specific output on a long analog line. In this case, the bit line of my SRAM memory, where all my memory cells of one column are hooked up to. So this will take the same role as the purple line in the previous slide. So it will accumulate the results of many multiplications. These multiplications I will do in each of the memory cells by first of all storing the different weights as the stored bit, eh, one bit weight, as the stored bit in each of these memory elements. So every memory element stores one bit and one column will basically store one column of my weight mate matrix. And this column will store another column. And what I will finally do to perform my multiplication is I will put my inputs here on the word lines, the horizontal word lines of my memory. 
So the first element goes to the first row, the last element goes to the last row. And this allows, and I'll show you next how this especially is done, but this allows to, in these memory cells, do the multiplication of a word, a blue input, with a red weight, and the result is put on the purple bar, and this is added up with the multiplication of another input, in this case the last one of my row, with another weight, the last one of my row, and this is accumulated to form this first output. And the same input is used when I multiply this row with another column of my weight. So this really allows to do computation inside the memory, reusing all the inputs as much as possible, doing analog accumulation for very efficient output addition. The open question is of course still, okay, but how can this SRAM cell now do a multiplication? Well, you can see that here. So what you see here is the circuit of a six transistor SRAM. And so I have my transistors activated by the word line and I have my cost coupled uh, inverters as my memory element where I store my weight bit here. What happens now if I put my input bit and the input bit is high, then it will activate this transistor and the weight bit will contribute to the current on the long purple bit line. If either my input is zero or my weight is zero, there will not be a contribution from this cell to the line and hence it will result in a current addition here, which is dependent on the product of the input, 0, 1, and the product of this weight value. So this effectively performs a multiplication and the blue, purple line then the KCL and uh, current addition. So this really allows me now to build super compact compute structures that are extremely energy efficient. I can no longer distinguish between the energy that goes to the memory or to the compute. They're kind of one blurred big thing, but I can bring efficiency down to one femtojoule per operation. This is very active research, which is still trying out many opportunities, also still going through many challenges. For example, these very rigid memories they don't really, they allow to do very efficient compute if my neural network maps perfectly on the architecture of my memory. But if I have a neural network that, or, or a neural network layer that looks slightly different, my efficiency might be completely gone. So this is called utilization. So many open challenges, many open opportunities, a very active field of research nowadays. So with this flyover of this field, I briefly wanted to show you how circuit designers have opportunities to keep, keep pushing down the energy consumptions of different blocks of neural network processors, shifting the boundaries or the bottlenecks from compute to memory, keeping optimizing one after the other to, to overall bring about a fact of thousand energy savings. And this is clearly not the end. We keep needing higher precision compute, more energy efficiency, throughput, increased flexibility for many types of machine learning models. This is really just the tip of the iceberg with many interesting things happening in this field. Obviously, it's a very lively field. And what I especially want to stress is that it's a field where we really have to combine expertise across different disciplines. You have to know a bit about the algorithms, computer architectures, circuit designs, also the applications, and bring all that together to come to a joint optimal solution. Very exciting, and it's just the start. So I hope with these lectures, I was really able to convince you that ML workloads are becoming increasingly popular and, and abundantly available in the cloud, in the edge. Dedicated processors really make the difference and are needed to get good energy efficiency and throughput. And circuit design provides very important answers and opportunities here. Where there are still many open challenges, but that's great because it brings also many interesting opportunities for us to research. In case you like the talk and you, and you want to hear or listen more, this is a collection of some related works by me, also by others, obviously on any, uh, any technique that I presented here today. There is a humongous amount of references in the back. I don't have all of them here, but these are more the general introductions, tutorials and overviews. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you.